It's always neat when you get a gift from God, right? Okay. Well, we've been learning how to say no. How are you guys doing? Can you do it? No. 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 Okay, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> right? Lots of things to say no to. Right? Uh, last week, we learned how to say uh, no to sin in my life. It's a pretty big thing to say no to, right? So, uh, we looked about, uh, looked, uh, learned about sin in the past, present, and the future. Obviously, we learned that we all have sin in our past, but we can be uh, get cleaned up now in the present, and we can keep clean every day of our future by the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. Uh, we learned that God always provides a way out of temptation so that we don't have to sin, and that we can say no to sin while we say yes to the cross. As you notice, each week, uh, we're finishing with the cross, because that's the most important thing, is our calling to the cross of Christ. And so this week, the subject I'm going to cover is called No Independence. No Independence. We're going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, and verses 19 through 27 there. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to explain to you kind of where I get this title from, right? Uh, think about our country, right? Something like the Declaration of Independence is a good thing for a great nation like America. Uh, the fact that we broke away from the dictatorships of Europe to form a country governed by the laws of God and the Bible, you know that thing, one nation under God? Really good thing for our country to be a, a country that was founded in that independence many years ago. Right, so what do I mean by this idea of no independence? Okay, well, what I mean by that is, uh, the title of this message, I'm talking about no independence from God, okay, because as Christians we live in complete dependence on God, so that's what I'm aiming for there, and also I'm talking about no independence from one another in the body of Christ, because as followers of Jesus we are to live in loving interdependence with one another uh, in order to uh, be the family of God for each other. And that's what you find when you join a local church is you find a loving family, right? It's the extension of your family. So that's why I chose this topic for today, uh, because it's our membership Sunday where several people today stood in front of you to say, we love this church and we want to officially join this family, okay? Those people were saying no to independence. No independence from God and no independence from one another. They joined the family. Okay, so this morning we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 19 through 27. And this scripture from Hebrews shows us why we must say no to independence from God and no to independence from one another. Okay, so let's read that together. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. <clears throat> Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up, up for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high peace, priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Well, those last two verses that we just read there show us the horrible end result of what happens to people who choose to live in independence from God. They may have a knowledge of God, notice, according to the scriptures, but their shallow religion 
uh, causes them to do something very different. Because they truly don't embrace a loving relationship with God. And so they fall back into sin. And in the end, their religion won't save them. Look at what it says there. Go back to verse 26 and 27 again. Right? And this is what we focused on last week, right? If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received a knowledge of the truth. Okay, where do people get a knowledge of the truth? Where do they get that? Church. They could get it in church, right? They could read the Word of God. Right? So these people are not ignorant that this verse is talking about. They have a knowledge of the truth. They've heard it. They've heard the Bible. They've heard it preached, maybe. They've heard people speak a couple of verses from the Bible, or maybe Grandma taught them a couple of stories from the Bible. Right? So they have a knowledge of the truth. Maybe they have a little bit of religion. But what are they doing instead? Notice it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have a knowledge of the truth, it says, no sacrifice for sins is left. And notice the future for these people who have religion, had some knowledge, but did not embrace a relationship with God. It says in verse 27, only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. That's not very good news, is it? You see, the way I see it, according to what the scripture is saying, is there's really only two types of people in the world. There are the enemies of God, like verse 27 described, right? Uh, who have this fearful expectation of the judgment of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God, right? So there's those people, that's one group. Or the other group of people would be the precious children of God who are living in a loving family of God, right? That's the two different kinds of people in the world. Now, you know, for us here this morning, right, I'm preaching to the choir, right? Isn't it hard to understand why every person would make the obviously better choice to embrace a love relationship with God? I mean, doesn't that just boggle your mind? Like, what's wrong with you people, you know, that won't accept God? Like, like, do you like the idea of raging fire and judgment? I mean, what's wrong? Right? We just don't get it, do we? Because we've discovered the love of God, and we can't imagine why anybody would choose something else. Right? So it's hard for us to understand. You know, maybe the devil has deceived them into thinking they should just not worry about that today. You know, it's kind of something like this, right? You know, I'm busy right now. I'll just think about God tomorrow. See, the problem with that is we have no guarantee of tomorrow, do we? No guarantee. Did you notice the last part of verse 25? Right? It says, let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You notice day is capitalized. So that means it's not just an ordinary day that he's talking about there, is it? He's talking about the day. What's he talking about there? The day when God comes to rule and reign in the world. Okay, a day of judgment, a day of the Lord's return. Okay, there's a day coming. Right? And that's the day he's talking about there. So some people say, oh, you know what? I got lots of stuff going on right now. I'll, I'll worry about God maybe, you know, some years from now when I'm getting ready to die. I'll worry about God then. Until then, I'm just going to, you know, eat, drink, and be merry or something like that. The problem is, there is coming a day when God will roll up the earth like a scroll, as the song says. And the thing is, if people don't embrace Jesus, before that day, it's going to be too late. You see, independence from God leads to judgment and an eternity <coughs> of flames. Look also in chapter 10 of Hebrews. Look at verses 37 to 39 there. Right? Notice what it says there. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Folks, we don't know when that's going to be. You know, it could happen before we go downstairs and have lunch, and that would be disappointing, right? In a way. But we don't know. It could happen before the end of today. We always can think like, oh, I'll have tomorrow. We have no guarantee that tomorrow will ever come. See, we have to know what's going on today, and we have to be in the right place today. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come. The day is coming, and he will not delay. But how do we act 
Verse 38 says, But my righteous one, well, my righteous ones, plural, could be that as well, will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, it shouldn't be us, if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. Verse 39 says, But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Right? We don't want to be part of that group of people who is going to be in the raging fire. We are not like those. We have faith. We are not like those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. See, that's a better plan for the future. And the Bible reveals that better plan for, for the future. And here's how I would frame it. Right? I would say it has to do with complete <coughs> dependence on God. That's the only thing that we can hope for for the future. Uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about that, right? Go back to verse 19. This is describing a life of complete dependence on God. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. What's he talking about there, the most holy place? But what the temple back at the time, right? The place where the presence of God would dwell. And you realize back then in the Jewish religion, it was only the high priest who only once a year was allowed to go behind the curtain into the presence of God to offer sacrifices for the people. And if he did it right, their sins would be covered for another year. If he did it wrong, they had a rope tied to his leg and they'd drag him out dead. Okay? Did you know that about the, uh, the Old Testament temple? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay? And so that most holy place... Only the high priest could go there once a year. But now because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, every single believer, every child of God, has the ability to go into the most holy place of God. How did we get there? Look at what the end of verse 19, 19 says, right? We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Why have we been focused so much on the cross of Christ? Because that's what it's all about. That's what Christianity is all about. The sacrifice of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Because without that, folks, we ain't going to no holy place without the blood of Christ. But Christ has opened up the way. Verse 20 says, He's opened up this way by a new living way opened up for us by the curtain. That is His body. There's only through the sacrificial death of Jesus that we can enter into the presence of God. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, and that's Jesus, and then it says in verse 22, this idea of complete dependence on God. It, said, it says, let us draw near to God. Draw near to God. That would be impossible if it were not for the blood of Christ. But because of the blood of Christ, now we can have complete dependence on God and draw near to God it says, with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith. Right? We have no doubts about the fact that the blood of Christ is sufficient to forgive our sins and to actually escort us into the very presence of God. So our hearts have been sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Symbolically, we've been washed of our sins. They've been washed away because of the blood of Christ. And so we can have great hope if we have a relationship with God and we live in complete dependence on God. And so that's why he says in verse 23, so then let us hold unswervingly. That means this is something that you can bank on. It's guaranteed. You can be absolutely sure of this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. So who promised this? God himself, not Pastor Mike, not somebody else. God himself has promised the, the uh, life that we can have if we live in dependence on God. You see, this relationship of complete dependence on God must be something that we seek after with everything inside of us. That is what God has called us to. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Right, again, talking about our faith. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay, so we need to have faith. He says, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Okay, but it doesn't stop there, right? Faith isn't simply just acknowledging, okay, yeah, God exists. Jesus died on the cross, he rose again. It's not just believing the information. 
It's embracing God with all that you have. That's what the very last part of the verse says, right? You must come to Him, you must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Do you want to be rewarded with, uh, from God uh, with the very best of life? Then we have to be people who earnestly seek Him. That's not half-heartedly. That's not when I have time. Oh yeah, I'll put God on my list somewhere. Earnestly seek Him means He's number one. We chase after Him with all we have and with all we are. But some people may ask, well, how do we do that? How do we seek God? You know, the answer is not really complicated at all. Right? We know this. We seek God with a passion for the Word of God and by a heart of sincere prayer. It's not complicated, but it takes time. It takes intention. It takes us to make a decision that God is going to be number one in our lives. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, look at verses 12 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4. I think it gives us uh, a little bit of an idea about this, about what it takes to seek God, right? A passion for the Word of God, a heart of sincere prayer. We find both of those in this passage. So in verse 12, it talks about the Word of God. The Word of God is a good thing to read once in a while, when we have time. <laughs> Not what it says, is it? No. So the word of God is living and active or powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Brothers and sisters, we must go to the word of God to be the kind of people that God wants us to be. We must saturate our lives with the word of God. And when we do, that word will have a powerful effect on our heart and our soul. We can't be the same as we used to be if we allow the word of God to do this work that's described in verse 12 there. Right? It says in verse 13, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Can't hide from God. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Remember I told you there's two groups of people in the world. The enemies of God and the precious children of God. Someday every single person is going to stand before God and be judged. Right? We're going to stand before Him, the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Right? Every single action, every single word. I know this is a scary thought, right? Everything about us, we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account someday. Right? That should scare us. Right? That's where the fear of the Lord comes in, right? The Word of God needs to teach us and train us to be different kinds of people so that when we stand before God someday, we have uh, the wonderful privilege of receiving His well done, good and faithful servant. But only if we allow the Word of God to transform us into the kind of people He wants us to be. Right? So I have a question. Right? I think you might know the answer to the question. We've been asking these questions all along. Right? In case you need a hint, the answer is going to be no. Okay. <laughs> right, so here's the question. When human pride tempts you to live independently from God, or to put off making a commitment to Him, what are you going to say? No. no. Of course you're going to say no. Yeah. We say no to independence from God, as we earnestly seek Him in Scripture and in prayer, He will show us the other form of independence to also reject. Right? And that's our next thing, right? Because we must reject any selfish independence also from one another. You see, the Bible teaches that there is no such thing as solitary Christianity. Have you ever heard anybody kind of make that statement, right? You know, like, I don't need to go to church, I can worship God out in the woods. Right? Did you ever hear anybody say that? Well, you know, there's some truth to that. I mean, yeah, it's possible to worship God in the woods. But guess what? When you go out in the woods and you're all by yourself, you're not with one another, are you? You're by yourself. Right? And so, you might be able to worship God, but the God that supposedly your worship is going to tell you, get back and also minister to your brothers and sisters in Christ, and love them, and be a part of one another. 
Right? That's what the God in the woods is going to say to you after you're done in the woods. Go back to the church, right? You see, solitary confinement is a punishment, right? When there's a prisoner in jail and they put him in solitary confinement, that's because he's been really bad. So the idea of solitary is not a good thing. It's not a preferred way of living. A true family is not a group of independent people with a legal agreement to share a house. You get it? Okay, so what is God's idea? God's idea is loving interdependence with one another. See, the body of Christ is every follower of Christ joining himself with every other member of God's family in loving interdependence. Go back to Hebrews chapter 10 again. Okay, where we read this morning. And look at verses 24 and 25. I think uh, he says it pretty plainly. And let us, notice us, not me, myself, and I in the woods. Okay? Let us consider how we, is that plural or singular? That's plural. Okay, may spur one another. How many people is that? A bunch of people. It's definitely more than one, right? Okay? On toward love and good deeds. Let us, there it is again, not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Uh, oh, what did that say? I'm worshiping God in the woods. Okay, I think God might point into this verse. Let us not give up meeting together. When you get out of the woods, go back to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Has anybody noticed that there's a lot of people these days that seem to have gained this habit that... Uh, we're talking about here, verse 25. Let's not give up meeting as some are in the habit of doing. Anybody here know somebody who has picked up that habit? No. Okay, like, ah, I don't need the church. I can, I can mm. do this on my own. Mm -hmm. Well, that's your idea. But you can't find it anywhere in the Bible. There is no such thing in the Bible as solitary Christianity. Right? Some people think they've got a different idea that's better. Guess what? They're wrong. Some are in the habit of doing this. But the end of the verse says, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Like we talked about, the day is coming. Brothers and sisters, we're in trouble. Right? Look at our culture and how lost it is. We need to encourage one another, don't we? Because I can get discouraged when I look at the heathen and the godless and the pagan and the wicked all around us, right? It can get pretty discouraging. Right? So where are we going to find encouragement? <clears throat> right here, right? Yeah. See? So instead of picking up this bad habit of ignoring the body of Christ, it says, let us not give up meeting together. Let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. You see, the closer we get to this day of God's consummation of all things, the more that the devil will tempt people to forget all about their brothers and sisters in Christ and do the solitary thing. Now, let's look at a couple other verses that kind of talk about this. Go to 1 John. And uh, I personally find these to be very disturbing verses because of what they describe. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. The heading on this passage in my Bible says, Warning against antichrists. There's lots of those going around today. I think some of them are running for political office. Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 18. That's just a little side note. Yes. Okay, verse 18. <laughs> Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. So he's talking about when things get really bad, this is what's going to describe those times, those, those last days before the return of Christ. This is what it says in verse 19. And, and notice again the plural, uh, the plural words there, right? You're going to find the word us five times in this one verse. Okay, now verse 19. They went out from us. Who's they? Okay, people that had a knowledge of the word of God, people who had some exposure to the church, people who had some connection with the body of Christ. But it says, they went out from us. There's the first us. 
Next phrase says, but they did not really belong to us. There's a second us, right? What, what do we do here today on Membership Sunday? Right? It's about us. Right? We're a family. We're together. It's all about one another. But see, there's another group of people who got into this bad habit. And it says they, these people who really didn't get the idea of this idea of loving interdependence, they just kind of do their own selfish thing, right? So it says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For, had, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. <laughs> Isn't that scary to think about that? Okay, some of you people have been around in church world for a long time, right? Okay, have you seen this happen? <laughs> Over mm. and over and over again. Robot. Do you find it disturbing? I do. Right? You know, for had they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Wow. It grieves my heart to see people wander into the church, but who make no lasting commitment and then they wander right back out again. Mm -hmm. You know? Such a sad thing. Turn to 1 Peter. <laughs> first, uh, yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2. This is where uh, Peter describes a better idea of interdependence. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. It says, live as free men. We love our freedom here in America, right? But what should we use our freedom for? Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. What is lots of people doing that? Instead it says, live as servants of God. Now if we're living as a servant of God, do you think he might want us, us to also serve one another? I, th I think he might, you know. <laughs> live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. What did that say? Oh, did you miss it? Let me read it again. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God, honor the king. See, I think God might want us to live in loving interdependence. Paul says something similar in Galatians chapter 6. If you like to turn there. Okay, Galatians chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 6 through 10. Right? Everybody got that? Okay, Galatians 6, start to verse 6. Anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. We did that last week, didn't we? Okay, do you see what this verse is saying? Who's your instructor on Sunday mornings? This goofy guy up here, right? Okay. So last week, I, I appreciate you guys, I love you guys, and just as an expression of thanks, you know the pastor appreciation thing, you had lunch for me and gave me a nice card, had money in it and everything, boy that was cool, right? My wife tried to take it, but not my husband now, so you know, okay? Right? So that's part of loving interdependence, right? You showed your commitment to me, because you know I'm committed to you, I love you guys, I'm here to serve you, I'll do anything I can to help you, right? But it's a, it's a two-way street, right? So verse 6 describes, how sometimes you, you bless your pastor as well, right? So go on to verse 7. It says, do not be deceived. <clears throat> Lots of people are deceived these days, folks. Absolutely deceived. Mm -hmm. The ways of the world are sucking people into the pit of hell. Paul says, don't be deceived. Go to God someday. And then they're going to go to a really hot place. God will not be mocked. And then he says this, a man reaps what he sows. So here's the question every man, woman, and child in America needs to ask himself. What am I sowing? How am I living? What kind of life am I leading? Right? Because according to how you sow, that's going to have something to do with what you reap in the end. He makes it very plain. Verse 8. The one who sows to please his sinful nature. How many people are doing that nowadays? Mm. 
Okay? The one who sows to please a sinful nature is going to have no problems at all. They're going to land in a nice, warm, fuzzy place in heaven someday, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it doesn't say that, does it? It says the one who sows to please a sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. Destruction. Right? That's the future for a person who mocks God, who gets deceived by the enemy to live life on their own. Right? We want to be the second half of verse 8. It says, The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. How many people here want to sow to please the Spirit? I think that's a better plan. Right? Let's sow to please the Spirit. Right? We do that by living in loving interdependence with one another. Right? That's what contributes to reaping eternal life. And so Paul says this in verses 9 and 10. So let us not become weary in doing good. Right? We get weary sometimes, right? Because we keep giving and serving and trying to help people. But sometimes people just reject us in the end anyway, right? And they just say, I'm just going to do what I want to do and I don't care. I'm just going to keep sinning and, and like whatever, right? So it can be weary. So that's why Paul says, don't become weary. Let us not become weary in doing good, because at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And that harvest is eternal life, right? So, folks, don't give up. Don't give up. And then notice verse 10, it talks about the family. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and that's good, but notice he says, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. If you look around you this morning, folks, this is your family. This is the family of believers. Amen. So it says, let us do good, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That is loving interdependence. Okay, so I'm going to ask you another question. I think you know the answer. Here's the question. So when other people irritate you, look at the person next to you. Okay. No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> We're behind you. We're in front of you. So when those people irritate you, and maybe they are not as spiritual as you are, so that you think you can worship God independently from other children in this family, will you walk away and forsake loving interdependence with one another? No. no. The answer should be no, right? No. The answer is no. <laughs> or even when kids crawl across the front of the church. Right? We love them anyway, right? <laughs> okay, so we say no. We must be transformed from being independent to being people of complete dependence on God and make a commitment to His family of loving interdependence with one another. Both of these things happen best when we come to this place. Here's the place. A place of total surrender to the cross. Total surrender to the cross. So I'm going to read from Galatians chapter 6. This is our last passage of scripture. Okay, and I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation because I think it brings out what I'm trying to communicate the best. But if you want to follow me in the New Living uh, or in the NIV, that's fine. But I'm going to read this passage from the New Living Translation, Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. Because I think these words describe very well this idea of total surrender to the cross. See, that's really what it's all about, folks. Our Christian faith, it's all about the cross. And not just the cross of Jesus, but us picking up our cross to follow Him. There has to be some sacrifice. If we're going to live in loving interdependence with one another, there has to be sacrifice. If we're going to live in dependence on God, there has to be something that we sacrifice. Right? So this passage describes that. Galatians 6, beginning in verse 11. Paul says, Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words with my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised are doing it for just one reason. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone is saved. You hear that? They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross 
of Christ alone can save. It's the only thing that can save anyone. The cross of Christ. Verse 13. And even those who advocate circumcision don't really keep the whole law. They only want you to be circumcised so they can brag about it and claim you as their disciples. And then we come to verse 14. I love verse 14. I have a passion for what it says in verse 14. And I hope that the words of this verse describe the passion of your life as well. Listen to these words carefully. This is Paul speaking. But it should be all of us that can say these same words. He says, as for me, God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interests in this world died long ago. And the world's interest in me is also long dead. Do you understand what he's saying there? Right? Because of that cross, my interest in this world died long ago. And the world's interest in me is also long dead. I'll just give you a little example from my own life, right? Uh, this last week, there was this thing uh, that people were all excited about. It's called the World Series. You hear about that? Okay. And so there was a news report on, you know, the news comes on, they have sports, whatever. Oh, it was the World Series, and, and there was a team that won. Well, who are they? Do you know? Okay, the Cubs, that's right. Right? So they were going, oh, the Cubs, they won the World Series. You know what I was thinking? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> that's what I who cares? I could care less. You know why? Because I've discovered something far better than a baseball team to worship. What do you get all excited about? Because they won the World Series. It's just a stupid game. You can call me a weirdo if you want. I don't really care. Because I've got a different passion. That's what Paul is saying right here. Because of that cross, how much do you love Jesus? Isn't he awesome? Don't you just want to do everything you possibly can for Jesus? Has he captured your heart? I say, because of that cross, my interest in this world died long ago. I can care less about stuff like the World Series. It just doesn't mean a hill of beans to me. If you get excited about that, that's fine. I don't care. But as for me, I'm with Paul. I'm with Paul. My interest in this world, I just don't care about the stuff of this world. I care about Christ and his kingdom. And the world's interest in me is also long dead. People think I'm a weirdo. I'm okay with that. You know? <clears throat> How about you? Could you say those words? My interest in this world died long ago. Think about it. You think about that. Verse 15 says, Does it make any difference now whether we have been circumcised or not? Paul's going to tell us what counts. What counts is whether we have really been changed into new and different people. That's what I care about, folks. I love you guys. I would do anything I can to serve you and do anything I can to help you. That's what gets me excited. Because when I have an opportunity to serve people and to help people, I see the face of Jesus. Hmm. I get to rub shoulders with Jesus every time that I get to serve people. I just love it. It's a thing that's the most important to me. It's what really counts. Whether we've been really changed into new and different people. Verse 16 says, May God's mercy and peace be upon all those who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. That's the people of God who live in loving interdependence, if I could say that word, it's a tough word, with one another, right? They're the new people of God that he's talking about there. That's what really matters. So he says this in the last two verses. 
So from now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things. For I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. See, that's a total surrender to the cross. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so ends Galatians chapter 6. So I have one final question for us. Okay? The answer is different than the first one. Okay? <laughs> Just to give you a hint. So here's our final question. Do you reject independence from God and from one another and instead earnestly seek God with a passion for the Word of God and prayer and commit yourself to loving interdependence in the family of God? Yes. Yes. Yes is the right answer. Because when you do, you will find that your interests in this world will die because you have surrendered all for your love to Jesus. God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful this morning for this precious cross of Christ. Father, we stand in awe and we marvel at how you could love us so much, even though we never deserved it. Father, we are sinners and we deserve judgment, but yet you sent your Son with the gift of immeasurable love to die on that cross of Calvary, to pay our penalty for sins so that we can be forgiven and experience life. Father, what a precious gift. We just grieve over those, Father, who reject that gift. That group of people who determine to live independently from God because they want to do their own thing. Father, it grieves our hearts because we know what their eternal destiny is going to be. And it's not a good one. If they don't receive the gift of life to Jesus Christ by giving their lives to Him, then they will receive the penalty of eternal death. Father, we pray that You would help us to continue to reach those people. Father, encourage us and help us to encourage one another because sometimes we get weary when the world ridicules us because we're followers of Jesus. Sometimes we get very, very weary. But Father, encourage us and lift us up. Help us to encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. The day when you will come back to make things right. To make all things right. To make us into completely new and perfect creatures worthy of heaven. Father, what a magnificent gift you have given to us, that we can enter into the very presence of God. And so, Father, we very readily come to the cross, there kneel in total surrender. Because we don't care about the stuff of this world anymore. Father, we recognize that all that stuff the world gets so excited about, in the end, is really just very insignificant. May we never boast except in the cross of Christ and the lives that we can live in the light of that cross. Thank you, Father, for that precious opportunity and privilege to serve you, to pick up our cross and follow you. We pray these things in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.